It looks like, yes, I can hear myself. We rolling? Hey, great. Hey, it's great to see everyone. Uh, we are at the, uh, what month is this? This is October already. We are at the October meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society, and I'd like to welcome everyone. We have a very nice crowd here this evening. A lot of faces, some faces that I haven't seen in a while. And uh, we've got hopefully some people joining us on our YouTube channel tonight. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, we're going to go through some announcements for a little bit here, and then at 7.30, we're going to have uh, tonight's guest presentation. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to extend on behalf of the club my heartfelt and deepest thanks for everyone who really made uh, Moon Over Monona Terrace a smashing success last week. Um, we had a lot of people from our club that uh, brought their telescopes and binoculars along. And we also had some people, a uh, shout out to the UW Astronomy Club uh, for bringing a bunch of telescopes because it was, it was a very large turnout. It turned out that it was a very nice sky that night. And um, I think even after nine o'clock, there was still a lot of long lines at uh, telescopes. And I think, uh, at the end of the night, we had, uh, by the end of the night, we had several people that uh, uh, requested information about Madison Astronomical Society and requested membership forms. So it is obvious that everybody's enthusiasm and friendliness um, just really was contagious. And, they, and, and, and I think a lot of guests had a really good time. Yeah, Jurgen. I, I have not yet, um, bef at some point, Monona Terrace will get back to us and they will have results from the, the survey. Since it was an Eventbrite uh, ticketed event, there will be an opportunity for people who attended to give feedback. And they'll also at that time give us a head count. So um, yeah, hopefully maybe I'll hear something next week sometime. So uh, just way to knock the ball out of the park, everyone. And I, I had a good time. I think everybody I saw there had a great time. So great job. Um, anybody have anything they wanted to share about the events last week? Oh, yes. Yes, you're again. Do all of you own your own telescopes? Yeah, I get that a lot. Yeah. So it was kind of funny. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's amazing. You know, not all that long ago, it was a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive to own telescopes. So. Yeah, what, 20, 30 years ago, that would be a, a really good question. But I think, yeah, these days, if for those of us who joined and like using the Yana Research Station, it seems more and more these days people just like bringing out their own telescopes and setting them up there at YRS and having a good time. All right, and I will look at, so try to refresh. Boy, it's been a long day and my brain is scrambled. Um, some interesting things going on. I noticed that the planetarium, I, for those of you who were with us a few years ago, when we had a meeting at the planetarium, they had just upgraded their system there um, to a modernized video-based system. And it, was, it was an amazing experience even back then. But I, I guess uh, this last summer, their director, Jeff Holt, had retired. And I'm having amnesia right now. Um, a couple of weeks ago at the at the uh, rededication of the Bell Burnell Observatory, I met the new observatory director there. And uh, oh, oh, Ben is his name? Ben Sensen. And oh, he, he was really great and friendly and uh, he seemed very enthusiastic and his, you know, his enthusiasm seemed contagious when I, because after that event, we had an evening viewing session and it was great hanging out with those guys. And so I guess now, in addition to having a new observatory director, they've gotten even more upgrades to that observatory, and they are having a fundraiser for that uh, this month. 
So instead of doing a standard planetarium show, um, they if you like B sci-fi B movies, this is your month to go there and go on to their website and buy a ticket. They are featuring four movies. The Last Man on Earth, which if you're familiar with Vincent Price and if you're familiar with Night of the Living Dead, I think this is the movie that inspired all these zombie movies, except it's not really a zombie movie, and I, that's one of my favorite movies. Another movie is It Came from Outer Space, I Married a Monster from Outer Space, and Plan 9 for, uh, from Outer Space. So, and some of those movies are showing more than once. And I, so go onto, the, onto their website and find out the details. That sure sounds like a lot of fun. And question, John, I see you have the microphone. Our next uh, meeting is coming up on Friday, November 11th. John, do you have any details about next month's presentation? The presentation next month is by a woman who I think has a joint appointment at the University in Chemistry and Astronomy. Her name is Susan Whittakus Weaver, and she's giving a talk entitled The Chemistry of the Universe. That sounds really good. Thank you, John. Awesome. <laughs> and I hear uh, one of our members who happens to be a member of the UW Astronomy Department, and now I'm having my momentary amnesia again. Bob Hammers just said she's really awesome. So, yeah, you will all want to attend that and uh, see what she's got for us. Also, membership renewals are coming up. Uh, Jurgen, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Uh, yeah, we had fairly decent, we've had fairly decent responses, slower than last year, which was slower than the year before. So get off your butts. <laughs> um, but if, if anybody has any renewals that they want to give me tonight, please do. A couple people said they would, but I'm not sure they're here. So I already did get a couple. Right now, we ended last year with 131 members. Right now, we've got 90, and that includes three new members. So, All right. Thanks for the update, Jurgen. Well, does anybody have any questions so far regarding any announcements or have anything they'd like to share about recent observing experiences and things like that? All right. Hey, and also, I understand there might be some people that are joining us for the first time tonight. Um, would you care to uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves? Yes, hello, I'm Carolyn Hackler, and I guess my um, maternal or paternal grandfather, rather, was the fourth president of this group. Well, how about that? So. <laughs> this is that you've picked the correct night to be here. <laughs> I'm guessing it's probably not coincidence. Carolyn is a VIP. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> It's great to meet you, Carol. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yes, sir. I'm not a VIP. I'm in the back row. I'm Murray Capel. I, I was at the event last week, and it was amazing. My mind was blown, and so here I am hanging out with you guys. <laughs> what was your name again? Murray. Murray Capel. Murray, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for joining us. And do we have any other people who would like to introduce themselves? Hi, uh, Paul Stefanski. I have no connection to this uh, group as our colleague here does, other than just um, being enthusiastic about it. This is a birthday present, actually, to me, the membership from my lovely wife, Eva. Here. Oh, how about that? Great idea. It makes a great gift. <laughs> you can use that in your marketing. Uh, and you, yes, it always, it's uh, always a great gift, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you both in the club. Thank you so much. And we've got, oh, yes, sir, back in the back, we've got two more here. Hi, my name is Jay White. Uh, I just moved back to Madison after, what, 26 years. So I just uh, joined the club. I was at the event last week, and I enjoyed that very much. I don't own a telescope, but I, I do want to buy one, and I was hoping to get some input <coughs> from some of the members here and some advice on what one to get. Great idea. Nice to meet you. Oh, where did you come from, by the way? Uh, I was, no, I used to live here, but I was in Seattle for 26 years. Oh, wow, yeah. I, Not a great place for astronomy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I was amazed. I went there when I was in the UW band. I, we went there for a trip, and I was like, man, this is just like Madison, except way better seafood. <laughs> <laughs> seafood is good. All right. And do we, I think we have another. Uh, oh, yes, sir, what's your name? 
my name is Wayne Wittenberg, and uh, I'm retired now, and I'm just interested in the uh, stars and the cosmos. So great. Thought I'd come to the meeting. So mm -hmm. nice to meet you, Wayne. Mm -hmm. And uh, two more, I think. Wait, is it, is it this part? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Emma Masinski. I've been to one of these, but like ten years ago. So it's been a long time. Thanks. Uh, my name's Owen. I come with Emma. I have. Uh, dabbled in astrophotography but oh, i'd like to do some more so well it's nice to see you again after 10 years <laughs> Thank we have more new members here than existing uh it's quite possibly <laughs> well all right um uh, we got just a couple more minutes to uh deal with before we get to our guest presentation um has anybody heard any interesting astronomy related things in the news that they'd like to talk about or I'm drawing what yes Jeff One that they've been sure most of us are aware of, but we've gotten the first results back with the dart impact Oh the dart oh yes yeah, the, the dart, dart impact and instead of a uh, 115 second uh, change in the orbital period of uh, of Didymos it's a 32 minute deceleration from that impact, which is just incredible. So it holds great hope for, you know, planetary defense in the future. So. Yeah, it sounded like it had way more effect, some more effect than they had expected. And I was actually kind of pleased that uh, the news media had remembered to follow up on that after they said, after the experiment had actually happened, that it was a complete success and they haven't even had any data for it yet. Yes, John. Um, I just thought uh, you might be interested to know that the UW astronomers have started observing again out at Kitt Peak. There was a big fire over the summer, which uh, fortunately stopped short. I should say was stopped short by the firefighters of the all the telescopes, so they didn't lose any, any equipment. But they haven't been observing until just, I think, last week was the first. And I saw a few pictures. One of the pictures is looking out the window of the wind telescope observing room out there and about 10 feet out is where the black uh, burned area starts and there's green stuff just right uh, b between th th that close up to the building so that's how close the fire uh, got to in, in particular our telescope so it was a, a narrow escape but an escape nonetheless and things are back in operating shape or getting there so I thought that was pretty good news thanks for sharing that that's fascinating Well, all right, it's almost 7.30, so uh, shall we go? I'll go ahead and introduce tonight's guest speaker. Um, for those of you, I haven't been around the club nearly as long as some of us have, but when I joined the club, our guest presenter was the president of Madison Astronomical Society at the time, and um, he's, uh, since then he's been, if you've uh, come here and enjoyed the presentations that we have here every month, and there's been a lot of amazing presentations and a lot of a variety of information. And it's just a, an asset to this community to have this club and have these guest presentations. And uh, John's been the fellow to really uh, recruit our speakers, and he's done an amazing job. And he's also managed to recruit himself. And the last couple of years, he's been working very hard on this topic. So I'd like to present everyone, uh, John Rummel, club president emeritus and uh, avid astrophotographer and avid friend of everyone in Madison Astronomical Society. Thank you, John. Thanks, Lars. <clears throat> the best part about being the person who finds the speakers is that I get to call my own name anytime I want to. <laughs> so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the history of the club. Um, as Lawrence said, for about the last two and a half years, a small group of us, um, actually we started when COVID started. Um, COVID shut down Madison and most of the rest of the country, and so we uh, needed a hobby. And so we got motivated to do some research into the history of this club. Um, and I've been kind of at the head of that. And so um, we, we, we did a talk early on in 2020, which was like our third or fourth meeting via Zoom. We talked about what the history committee was doing, uh, but tonight is really kind of giving you the, uh, the summation or uh, the first unveiling, I guess, of the history. And so we're gonna go through um, what is 
you know, as to the first part of the history, we had to stop somewhere, and so we stopped at 1988, which was when the club underwent a big transition from its observing site in Fitchburg down to its dark sky site, uh, where that site currently still is in uh, Greene County at Yana Research Station. Um, the bulk of this project over the last two and a half years has really been archival for the most part. Um, whoops. We have interviewed over 60 people, uh, tracking down former members of the club, uh, in some cases, children and grandchildren of former members of the club. But we've tracked down quite a few previous members. We've gathered a lot of different items. And I did bring some show and tell with me tonight. So I'm gonna actually show you some of those items and give you a chance to look at and handle some of those items tonight, just after the talk is done. It's gonna be a relatively short talk. Um, so old newsletters, brochures, announcements, and so forth. 2,500 separate items. Um, newspaper clippings, because back in the 1930s and the 1940s, everything showed up in the newspaper. And so it made it really easy to trace a lot of the aspects of the history of the club, because so much was printed in the newspaper on a week-to-week -week basis. And uh, a lot of photos that have come in from previous members, uh, children and grandchildren of members, and from uh, you know, looking at old shoe boxes and things like that. <clears throat> so starting out with the history of the club, one of the first things that we found was this document, which had been floating around the club for years. Prior to our effort to document the history of the MAS, this was the history of the MAS, essentially a one-page document. Nobody knew when it was written. Nobody knew who wrote it. It had just been around. Uh, various people had copies of it in their own folders and their own papers. Um, and we managed to track down a couple of copies. Uh, Dave Darling owned this copy, and Dave had a habit of writing his name uh, on the top of a lot of items of club memorabilia. So Dave provided this copy to us. Dave is a, a former member of the club, mostly from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, this document really contained all that we knew about the history of the club. The first paragraph there, which I, I won't read much to you tonight, but I'm going to read a few things. Um, this lays out kind of the narrative of the story. It tells a story about the founding of the club. And um, again, this was all we knew, but this managed to introduce a couple of the major players. The earliest plans for the creation of an astronomical society in Madison can be traced back to October 1930, when Mr. William Binney and Mr. John English discussed their common interest in lens grinding and observing, as well as the possibility of attracting other would-be astronomers to probe the mystery of the stellar world. Soon after, Dr. C.M. Huffer, a member of the astronomy department of the University of Wisconsin, who knew about Dr. Binney's hobby, was invited to dinner by Dr. J.S. Supernaw, a prominent Madison physician. The host, as it turned out, was also interested in amateur astronomy. Ideas were exchanged, and finally, in early 1931, the Madison Astronomical Society was actually launched through the combined efforts of the four pioneers and a few friends. So that first paragraph encapsulates the history, the beginning, the genesis of the club. It turns out they got the dates wrong, and, and we think that the dates were just kind of, as the club grew up in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, eventually, confusion reigned and somebody suggested the wrong dates. So we know that the tracing the beginning back to the October of 1930 to those conversations and then the final formation of the club in early 1931, they got it wrong by about four years. The club was actually formed in late 1934 and early 1935 and I'll share with you some of that documentation. So there were a number of copies of this document laying around. Another copy that we came across was this one, which came from the children of a former, now deceased member. They had a box of materials uh, from their dad that they'd actually tried to give to the club back in the early 2000s, and nobody returned their calls or emails. And so luckily, they sat on it for almost 15 years and finally got it to the club in around 2019 or 2020. Dan, this is the cache of, of documents that you received. Um, and so here is the same history of the society, but with a handwritten note across the top that says, written by 
Professor E. Neil Silva, now living at 5302 Fairview Drive. So we don't know who wrote that, but whoever wrote that note gave us the authorship of the document. So I immediately you know, went back into the, the archives that we had gathered uh, because I was familiar with the name of Dr. Neal or Professor Neal um, from some older members who remembered him. Uh, but Eduardo Neal Silva was a member of the club in the 1960s. And he is the one, evidently, according to this note, who sat down and wrote this one page history. There is some evidence within the document itself that you can use to date it. Uh, because it refers to certain events and certain happenings and the ownership of certain equipment and things like that. So just using internal evidence, we were able to date this document to probably 1962 or 1963. And that corresponds exactly to when Eduardo Neil Silva was active in the club. Most of his activity with the club came between 1960 and 1966. So it makes sense. Um, but I'm going to come back to this a little bit later on because when you find little bits and pieces of information like this, it just starts to bug you. Who wrote that? You know, who was, who was the kind soul who took their pen and, and wrote down for us a piece of information like that? And I'll, I'll come back to that. But I wanna, I wanna start with those four pioneers and uh, a few of their friends, because those are the people um, to whom the origin of the club, the genesis of the club can be attributed. And so here they are, here are the four that Neil Silva mentioned. Bill Binney, Jack English, Charles Huffer, and Jack Supernaw. Each one of these men is a great story. Um, there, are, there are just, I mean, this is, this is just a bundle of really good stories. I'm not gonna try to you know, go through all the information that we gather because it's a lot, but I do wanna give you a flavor of what we believe otherwise just would have been lost. It's very possible that had it not been for those names in that first paragraph of that Neil Silva document, that, that even these names would, would, would have been lost, that nobody would have remembered them, but we do remember them. And we also have a good idea of who the few friends were. There are quite a few candidates for the few friends, but I'm going to highlight especially two of them, Paula Berner and Randall Lookabill. And so I'm just gonna tell briefly a couple of these stories tonight. We're gonna start with Randall Lookabill. Lookabill was a minister at the First Christian Church of Madison. He only ministered there from about 1930 through 1937. So he was only in Madison for about seven years. He came to Madison from another church, most likely Dayton, Ohio, and then he left Madison to go to Michigan, um, as preachers often do, uh, you know, moving around from church to church. His seven years in Madison were pretty, pretty meaningful though. As a minister, he was officiating at weddings and funerals just about every week. So if you opened up the newspaper uh, and, and you read the wedding section, you would see his name frequently. If you read the obituaries, you would see his name frequently. He was, um, he was a very visible member of the clergy in Madison. He was also a frequent speaker at places like Rotary Clubs and, and civic societies like that. He was a very beloved member of the community, very well known. In 1934, the Wisconsin State Journal ran this feature article about him. Uh, the State Journal still does, um, I forget what they call it, but it's like prominent members of the public or prominent citizens. They profile members of the public. So uh, he points with pardonable pride, pastor fulfills boyhood dream, builds telescopes. Lookabill was an avid amateur astronomer and he was an avid telescope maker, and he was also a bit of a magnet for acquiring telescopes from other people. This article, uh, which goes on for a second page, um, I only printed a little bit of it here, along with that great picture of him standing in his yard with his uh, hand-built from spare parts telescope. Lookabill um, was quite a character, and he was very, very involved in the origins of the society. So part of how we know the club really wasn't formed until late 1934, early 1935, comes from this article where there is a quote uh, where the author of the article uh, talking to Lookabill says, um, since there are many in Madison burning the midnight oil in efforts to construct telescopes, Mr. Lookabill believes an astronomical society 
will be organized next year. He was instrumental in reviving such a society in Dayton, Ohio, of which Orville Wright, inventor, and his sister Catherine were members. So we know that as of July 1934, there was not yet a formal astronomy club. There were people who were doing astronomy, there were people who were building telescopes, but there not, was not a club yet. And Lookabill believed, uh, probably because he had some pretty good inside information, that a club was coming pretty quickly. And, and sure enough, by early the next year, um, MAS was formed. So that was Lookabill. There's a lot more that we could say about Lookabill. Um, and I'll give you some pointers to some additional information on him later. Quite a character, quite a guy. Even after he left Madison, he was still in touch. He made a lot of friends in Madison, including MAS. And he came back and he was still in touch with the club for, for years to come. Lookabill, great guy. Another one that I'll mention is Dr. Supernaw. Jack Supernaw was the first president of the club. In many ways, he probably was one of the, the, the original movers, the, you know, the, the organizers. He, you know, he got it going and, and probably brought some organization to that group of people who were interested. Um, in early 1935, this Wisconsin State Journal article managed to spell his name wrong in the headline, but they got it right in the body of the article itself. So Dr. Supernaw heads Astronomical Society. This is essentially the birth certificate of the club because the March article recounts the meeting, you can see in that first paragraph, just that previous week, was the first meeting, formal meeting, uh, formation of the Madison Astronomical Society. Um, there's a lot, there was a lot in the newspaper about things like that back in the day. I spent a lot of time reading uh, neighboring articles. Um, Superna is a really interesting story. And again, I'm not going to go into all of it tonight, but all of these people have, have great stories behind them and, and we're very fortunate to have uncovered that. I do want to pull a quote from this article, um, pull a couple of quotes maybe. Probably talking to Superna, the author of the article said, that the society is contemplating publishing a monthly paper, newsletter, for its members and others interested in scientific study. It's also considering a junior club to take care of the growing interest among astronomy students of the vocational and city high schools. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about the vocational school, but it's interesting that, that right away, they are pointing to interest coming from young people and citing that as one of the motivating factors behind putting together a club. He goes on to say, the society plans to cooperate with other astronomy clubs throughout the state. Telescopic observation charts of shooting stars or meteors were made on the Monona golf course last fall by a group of interested astronomers who are now members of the society. And he's pointing back to um, the Perseid meteor shower of 1934, of which um, there was great interest in the Madison area in what turns out to be a lot of people who went on to become members of the Madison Astronomical Society. So that was the newspaper article that is, again, kind of the birth certificate of the club, March 1935. In May, Madison Astronomical Society released its first newsletter. This is a, um, just a copy of the first page. And you can see that the feature article, Our Society, was written by Dr. Supernaw in all of his association with the club. This is the only piece that we know of that was authored by him. Uh, many, many newsletters and, and other you know, products that we have, he gave a lot of talks. Uh, he visited schools and gave talks to school children. But this is the only piece that was written by him. And you can see in that first paragraph, he cites a class from the extension department of our state university the UW-Madison Extension Program then, just as now, offers classes that can be taken by anybody. And um, Dr. Huffer, another one of the four pioneers, um, taught an astronomy class um, in Madison. He also taught one, I don't want to say Racine, but I'm not absolutely positive about that. But 1934, as far as we know, was his first class. And Dr. Suprana cites in this first paragraph that it was people who took Dr. Huffer's class ended up loving astronomy and, and 
essentially probably, this is speculation, but probably said to Dr. Huffer, hey, you know, we'd like to have a club. And Dr. Huffer said, well, then have a club. You know, here you are. And, and it was the nucleus of people who had taken his class who eventually came together to form the Madison Astronomical Society. I'll come back briefly to the extension class a little bit later too. One pull quote from Dr. Supernaw's article. Among the lens makers, inventors, artists, lovers of nature, and cold-blooded fact gatherers, we hope to enjoy and disseminate a better understanding of the universe we live in, and again, a more intimate knowledge of those mysterious points of light scattered over the night sky. Dr. Supernaw was a bit of a poet. And I love that phrase. You, you kind of chuckled at it, cold-blooded fact gatherers. Which, um, everything that he said, both in the newspaper article before and in this article, I think he, I mean, that's the club that they created. And remarkably enough, almost 90 years later, that is still the club that we are. That is still the club that we have, including the cold-blooded fact gatherers <laughs> among us. Dr. Supernaw was a, a physician. He was a prominent physician, like, like Reverend Lookabill was very well known as a minister in the community. Dr. Supernaw was in the paper all the time. Um, it, I never found any evidence that he was the coroner, but any time there was a crime committed where there was a medical angle that needed a comment in the newspaper, Dr. Supernaw was the guy that they talked to, and so he was constantly in the paper. He was also on a number of boards of directors. He served um, a year as the, on the Board of Education in Madison, um, very active in civic affairs, uh, and very highly regarded in the community. Um, Dr. Supernaw was um, also controversial in his death. Um, he died in 1960 by suicide. And his, his suicide was, I'm not going to go into detail, but it, it ended up being controversial. And because of his high profile um, status in the community and the lurid aspect of his death, this was front page newspaper, including two inch headlines at one point above the fold on the front page. It was evidently, uh, I mean, there were, there were just aspects of his suicide that needed to be investigated. It was finally, the investigation was closed and it was determined that it was in fact a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That's how he died. And then it disappeared from the front pages. But it was big news for a while. Dr. Supernaw. One more of these founder people, Jack English. This is just another one of those cool stories, great stories. Jack English was a chemistry teacher at the vocational school. So there's a connection to the vocational school early on. As a teacher there, he, using his connections, uh, found rooms and many of the early meetings of the society took place, probably in classrooms or conference rooms or whatever at the vocational school. The vocational school was founded in the, like the, the early 19 teens and went by that name all the way into the 1960s when in 1967 it was renamed Madison Area Technical College. Um, in fact, they used the same building that was one of MATC's early buildings down on Carroll Street. So Jack English taught chemistry there, uh, evidently took astronomy into his classroom because maybe it was some of his students who were those young people who were interested in astronomy and, and provided some of the, um, the push to form a club. One of the things that I love about Jack English is the mystery. And that Neil Silva history document later on is this paragraph. Um, this paragraph, Silva mentions the extension division classes, that the classes were responsible, and then he goes on to uh, cite in, in September 1956, it celebrated a quarter century of its existence at its first meeting in the 56-57 season. Notice the quarter century, if you do the math there with the 56-57, they already have the dates a little bit wrong, but it's very forgivable. But it goes on to say, Mr. John English, who had been one of its most devoted members, then read a paper entitled History of the Club. We do not have that document. And I would love to find out what he wrote in 1956 about the, I'm assuming he wrote it, it doesn't say that he wrote it, but I'm assuming that he did or he read it as it had been written by somebody else. So John English's history did not survive, did not come down to us. Um, <clears throat> John English is one of the uh, people who I tracked down grandchildren. Um, I knew of his son, his son became a physician and was a very prominent physician in Ohio, 
but unfortunately his son died in the, uh, the early 2000s or something like that. Uh, so I was able to track down a couple of John English's son's children, so grandchildren, and two of them, two grandsons living in Ohio, and they were kind enough to talk to me on the phone and very well remembered their grandfather visiting his house when they were young. In fact, they said to me, have you been to his house in Monona? His telescope is still in the backyard. And I, I tried to gently explain to them, you know, uh, Mr. English having died in 1958 and his house was sold almost immediately after he died. Telescopes that were in backyards in the 1950s, 60 plus years later, you know, they're not there anymore. And so I, I was just trying to explain to them why what they were telling me was impossible. And they said, no, we were just, we were just in Madison last year. We drove by the house. The telescope is there. So of course I got the address. Monona Drive, this is his house, uh, 4301. And if you look there in the side yard, John English's telescope. I, this was in 2021, so I haven't been back there in over a year, but it's a hollow metal tube. It's badly rusted. There's no mirror cell. There's no focuser, there's no secondary assembly. You know, it's basically just the tube, the, um, the remains of the equatorial mount, and a pretty sturdy pier. Now, the equatorial mount is oriented toward the south. It's not, it's not, it's not polar aligned toward the north. Um, and you know, 60 plus years on, it's possible that somebody disassembled it and put it back. It's, you know, who knows what could have happened? And clearly it hasn't been used as an astronomical instrument in a long time. But his kids were right. It was still there. This is John English's telescope. And even in the condition that it's in, 60 plus years, this was a well-built instrument in its day. Uh, this is a picture of John in his backyard at his previous residence in Madison. Now, this is not the Monona house. Monona Drive house, this is a previous house, and there on the right is recognizably the same equatorial mount and the same telescope, and there's a side-by-side. -side. So much to my chagrin, his kids were absolutely correct. His telescope was still there. I shared this story widely after I found it, both with, within the club and uh, with some friends of mine, um, people who live in Monona who jog or bike or walk up and down Monona Drive all the time, and many of them said, I always wondered about that telescope. Thank you for you know, telling us the story. Founder of the club, John English, chemistry teacher at the vocational school. What a great story. Finally, Paula Berner. I'm going to end with Paula tonight. Um, some of you who have spoken to me over the past two years know of my borderline obsession <laughs> with Paula Berner. Of all the characters in the early club, Paula Berner is the one who absolutely hands down has grabbed my attention. Paula Berner is, um, is a story kind of in three parts, and I'm just going to breeze through the first part. Um, she was present before the beginning, so she was around in 1934. Uh, didn't get her name mentioned in the founding you know, history, historical document of the club, but she was definitely there. Paula was on the radio in 1934, WHA Radio in Madison, giving talks entitled Watchers of the Sky. None of the talks survive, no transcripts, nothing like that. Uh, we don't know exactly how many there were, but it was evidently uh, popular enough or, or well-known enough that, that she was recruited into some other cities in Madison, Stevens Point as an example, where radio stations there had her probably repeat the programs that she had given in Madison. We believe the programs were of the, of the nature of, you know, what's up in the sky tonight, maybe a tour through the winter constellations, you know, something of that nature, maybe highlighting a comet or the, the visible planets, that sort of thing. So Paula Berner was on the radio. Later in the 1930s, she wrote a series of 11 columns for the Wisconsin State Journal. And if you've read any of the columns in Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine about the current night sky, Walter Scott Houston type things, that's what she wrote about. Um, one of the pieces that she wrote in December was on the Star of Bethlehem, astronomical theories about the Star of Bethlehem. She was a good writer, and to write that kind of thing, you need to know astronomy. Paula knew astronomy. So this was in Madison. She came to Madison in 1934 
as an elementary teacher at Lapham Elementary School. And that was the same fall that she was on the radio and she wrote the story. So we don't know where she was prior to 1934. She graduated from La Crosse Normal School, now known as the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, with a teaching degree in 1922. We don't know where she was for the 12 years prior to 1934, but she showed up in Madison as a teacher and she showed up in the Madison Astronomical Society um, gangbusters, um, doing things with the club. So, 1944, she married. She was, a, she was a single woman for the first 43 years of her life, born in 1901. She married in 1944 to Orville Carey. And so th thereafter, she was known as Paula Carey, sometimes as Paula B. Carey, sometimes as Paula Berner Carey, but always using the last name Carey. Orville Carey died just four years later in 1948, so she was widowed. They didn't have kids, and she never remarried, as far as we know. So she was a, a widow, a single woman, for the rest of her life. Her movements are kind of difficult to track. We know that she didn't stay in Madison teaching for long. She, she was in some other schools. She was in Middleton. She was in McFarland. She taught high school in Randolph, Wisconsin, up near Beaver Dam, for at least one year, high school physics and, and chemistry, <clears throat> around the time that she married Mr. Carey, and, um, and then we kind of lose track of her. So uh, remember those 11 columns for the Wisconsin State Journal. I'm going to come back and I'm going to briefly mention one of those later. But um, Paula kind of fell off the radar, uh, presumably because she moved away. And, and for a while, that was where the story rested. Just amazing woman um, in the Astronomical Society in the 1930s. And let me just say that in the 1930s, being a woman in a club like this usually met, meant that you served tea and cookies to the men who came to the meeting. Uh, women were usually the spouses of the members and they were usually the hostesses of the meetings. That was not the case with Paula. Paula was very definitely a, a serious astronomical observer and a serious amateur astronomer in her own right. So eventually, accidentally, I picked up the thread again because I was searching newspaper archives, and this time not just for Madison and Madison area, but for the whole state. And this popped up in Racine in 1956. So this is now 12 years after the death of her husband. In the meantime, she had settled in Racine and was teaching there. And I'll just let you read this. It's not that long. Letter to the editor. So I know not everybody can see that as well. She's essentially pining for an astronomy club. She wants an astronomy club. That last paragraph, actually the PS, lots of kids want to come here, but beyond a certain point, that is work. Remember, she's an elementary school teacher, and I, I bet that her kids got a good dose of astronomy, but Paula doesn't want to form a kids club. Paula is longing for what she had in Madison, the Madison Astronomical Society that she helped form has no counterpart in Racine. She wants an astronomy club in Racine. Isn't that great? I love the fact that she wrote this letter to the editor. That was August 1956. A couple months later, October 1956. <laughs> I'm not going to challenge you to try to read this. The headline says, Astronomy Club Now Organized. And in that article, Paul was elected secretary the first slate of officers. She would later serve as president of the Racine Astronomical Society as well. So Paula's letter to the editor did the trick. An astronomy club was organized in Racine. Three years later, the Sunday paper, the Racine Journal Times, this is the Sunday section called Society and Women's News. Astronomers find pathway to the stars. This is a feature full page article 
just three years after the founding of the club with pictures galore, clearly the Racine Astronomical Society took root. Almost every person pictured in those photographs is a man, in spite of it being on the women's news page. There are some women in, in that picture of the crowd, but, but already, you know, in, in tune with the times, the men are getting, you know, most of the billing of the club. Paula is also mentioned in this article as an active member and officer in the club. But just three years later, they're already getting a feature article in the local newspaper. <clears throat> okay, fast forward. October 1963. Public can visit Racine Observatory today. Now, the observatory that they're talking about is the Modine Benstead Observatory in Racine. I don't have a contemporary picture, although I found one, so it's later, but, but this is a current picture of the Modine Benstead Observatory. The building on the right is the, the original observatory, a two-floor um, structure. The small dome on the left was added more recently, but that is, that's, a, that's a good observatory for a small town astronomy club like Racine. Paula's club, just seven years after its founding, they did fundraising, they found benefactors. Um, they, they, I mean, this is a claim to fame of a serious astronomy club. The uh, newspaper article that's across the top there, public can visit the observatory today in October, 1963. That was a full page feature article too. Pictures, uh, text ex explaining who Modine and Benstead were, uh, explaining who the officers of the club were who, who spearheaded the fundraising. Paula's name is not mentioned. By 1963, Paula has fallen out of the headlines, so to speak. October is when this was published. November, this letter to the editor appears in the paper. And I'll read this one. One who brought idea to Racine. Dear sir, last Sunday the Journal Times published a fine article with equally fine pictures about the new observatory. Few cities the size of Racine can boast such an accomplishment. Many of us felt there was just one omission. It's not too late, we are sure, to pass one of the bouquets to Mrs. Paula Carey, who brought the dream of an astronomical society to Racine and worked so hard to start the dream on its way to fulfillment. And it's anonymous, but somebody recognized the oversight and wanted to make sure that Paula uh, got credit for her part in the founding of that society. The year after, in 1964, Sky and Telescope magazine had a feature called Amateur Briefs, where they would hear from clubs around the country. And this, this article, starting with amateur astronomers, a new observatory in Wisconsin, and then it's that two columns and uh, the first third of the following page is a, uh, uh, a feature article in that section of Sky and Telescope by Paula, of course. And um, that was 1964. After 1964, the story kind of goes cold again. There were some uh, notices in the newspaper. For instance, we know that Paula served as a delegate, a delegate to the Astronomical League she attended meetings all over the country. I, I'm aware of like Chicago and onto the East Coast where she attended Astronomical League meetings. Um, she was a serious amateur astronomer. She also wrote additional pieces in the newspaper in Racine. So she was published again, writing astronomy pieces in the local paper. And after that, the trail did go cold. I was unable to determine, by the 1960s, Paula was in her 60s probably close to retirement age as a teacher. <clears throat> so that's where the story ended until I was in, in pursuit of this project, of the history of this project. I was at our clubhouse, YRS. Some of you know that on the walls of our clubhouse, there are pictures, there are tributes to some prior members, people who built the clubhouse, people who helped to build YRS. There's a plaque, it's kind of hidden away on the watch. It's in a place where it's difficult to see and the lighting is very poor. But I'd seen this plaque before, but I'd never really looked at the names. So I just started taking a look at the names. Uh, this was probably in the late 1980s because YRS was founded in about 85, 84, 85. 
So people who donated to the construction of YRS in the amount of 100 or 500 or $1,000. And right there in the middle column, Paul Carey. Now, this was in the 1980s, the late 1980s. Paula would have been in her 80s by this time. Was she living as a retired teacher in Racine, but she just kept in touch with the Madison Astronomical Society? And when Madison acquired its new observatory in Greene County, Paula wanted to donate. $500 was a lot of money in 1986, 1987. So I was fascinated. Thankfully, at this time, this was mid-2020, late 2020, um, Dan Strom had done a lot of work in collecting membership lists from the club over the years. So I pulled out the membership lists that we had. This is not an actual membership list. This is reconstructed. Uh, Eric Thede was the treasurer back then. And uh, the checkbook register, which noted every check that came in, we used the checkbook register to reconstruct the membership list. Paula Carey. This was the first time she appears in club records after she left in the 1940s. Sometime in the 1970s, Paula rejoined the club. And there she was. This is another list from 1985. This is an actual list. There's Paula with a Madison address. So we know she wasn't living in Racine. She moved back to Madison in retirement. Winnemac Avenue is behind Midvale School, just off of Midvale and the Madison's, what was then the far west side. Now it's kind of the middle west side. 1985, Paula was in the club. Paula died in 1993, aged 92. She was a widow, never remarried. By the time you get to be 92 years old, a lot of your friends are often gone. We never found an obituary. Maybe nobody was around to write one. We did find evidence of a burial, a grave in Appleton. I can't explain that, but the dates match. 1901 to 1993. Why she would have been buried in Appleton, I don't know. But we've never been able to locate any relatives. We've never been able to get our hands on anybody who knew Paula. But she was in the club in the 70s and 80s, and maybe even as late as 1990, 91, 92. There are a lot of people in the club now who were still around, who were around then. So I, I went to everybody. I went to everybody that I could find. And I gave them the name and told them the backstory. And there were a few people who said, yeah, the name rings a bell. I remember the name Paula Carey. I don't remember anything else. One of our members, Jane Bruin, some of you know Jane. She used to be the organizer for the speakers. Of the club. Jane did a lot of other things too. Jane, as a woman in the club in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, women t you know, tended to, to stick together. Women tended to uh, you know, support each other. Jane remembered Paula Carey, and she described Paula Carey as the little old lady who occasionally would show up to meetings, sat in the back, cardigan sweaters, gray hair, and she talked about having been a member of the Racine Club. I am willing to say that nobody knew who Paula Carey was. That sitting there in this meeting was a founder of the club who went all the way back to 1934. And, you know, I was in Madison in the early 90s. I wasn't a member of the club yet. I would give anything to be able to go back and sit down and have a talk with Paula and to see what she remembers and see what she could tell us about the club. So my obsession with Paula, I think, is probably pretty clear. Let's go back to that document. The Eduardo Neil Silva history with the note on the top. Who wrote that? Another item that we have from the history of the club is this notebook. This is the oldest and most venerable piece of history that we have, composition book, in which starting in 1936 and going up until about 1947, 11 years, the very early history of the club, the minutes of meetings and some other minutia of the club were recorded in this book. One of the club meetings, May 1939, the minutes of the club, it was just, it was just a MAS meeting. 
Uh, the society met at 8 p.m. at the Mechanical Engineering Building. That was unusual. For a demonstration of the planetarium by Mr. Looks like a J, but it's F. Mr. F. D. Winkley. Mr. Winkley is a great story, too. Uh, Winkley was an engineer. He was an old guy by this time. He died just a few years later. Winkley was actually there when Washburn was being built. And, and Winkley had a hand in the building of the Washburn Observatory, knew all the early directors and so forth. But by this time, Winkley was, he had worked in industry in the Madison area for years and years and years. He was long retired, never ceased being interested in astronomy. The planetarium piece of this I'm not sure about. Um, Jim, I think you and I have talked about this. There may have been a planetarium in mechanical engineering that predated the Spitz projector that is now in Sterling. But Winkley also built Ori's. And in a lot of the, the literature that we have, people confused the word Ori for planetarium. Ori's are those desktop models of the solar system. The planets go around the sun, you turn a crank and, and the orbits are true. And so you know the Earth goes around the sun once and Mars goes halfway around and so forth. So he built Ori's and sometimes people confused it. But whether they were going to see his Ori's or his planetarium, I'm not sure. But anyway, at the bottom of this page, somebody wrote a note in a different hand, in a different ink. Note, notice I wrote about Mr. Winkley in my article titled, Nearly 100 Astronomers Meet at Picnic on Hill, P. Carey. She's referencing one of the articles that she wrote for the Capital Times. That article appeared in 1940. These minutes were from 1939. At some point after the fact, Paula had this book and she added that note to the bottom of that page pointing to the newspaper article that she wrote where Mr. Winkley was mentioned. Here's the note at the top of Neil Silva's um, history and here's that, that Paula note. Now I'm not a handwriting analyst, I have no expertise, but it looks like Paula could have written the note at the top of Neil Silva's history. And that would have had to have been written after 1962 or 63, because that's when Neil Silva wrote that piece. Here's another example of Paula's writing later on in this booklet. Um, there's another mention of Winkley, and she again mentions her article, see my article, nearly 100 astronomers meet. So another example of Paula's writing in this booklet. Since then, I've gone back through our archives and I've come across a couple other times when Paula added a note to something that, you know, go figure. Here's another one. Whoops, I was going to, these are the letters. My amateur handwriting analysis. Two examples of ends. Notice the long tails on the ends. That's the unknown handwriting at top. And then notice Paula's use of the N, all of which have the long tails. <clears throat> I would love to get a genuine handwriting analyst, you know, to do some work here, but, but that's all I have. Um, this is a, a list of people who uh, made reservations for one of our banquets. No date. We don't know exactly when this banquet was, but the ever resourceful Paula Carey, whose name appears there misspelled, C-A-R-Y, Paula corrected the record. <laughs> Paula B. Carey, and it's Mrs., not Mr. She scratched out the Mr. And then she wrote the note over to the side. It must have been after 1944. I was married in 1944. So because they used the name Carey on the reservation, it had to have been after she married Orville Carey. The banquet was probably in 46 or 47. We have some evidence of that. But again, an example of Paula having access to a piece of of documentation of the history of the club and helpfully, you know, giving us some additional information. One more, that this, and this is a strange one. I mentioned the extension classes early. This is a syllabus from Dr. Huffer's extension class in astronomy, but this syllabus is dated 1964. 1964. Now this is perplexing because Huffer retired in the 1960-61 academic year and moved to California. Why his syllabus was still being printed in 1964, I'm not clear on that. Jim, I haven't shared this with you yet. You can see Jim is, is interested. Paula may have been 
one of the students in one of those first extension classes back in 1934, 35, 36. But here, Paula has a copy of the 1964 syllabus in which she wrote her name and her Racine address at the top there. The, the cover gives the date. And I, I don't have a picture of the cover, but I have the entire book. I have the whole syllabus. The perplexing thing about this is this was on the bookshelf at YRS. I just found it yesterday. How did, how did Paula happen to have a 1964 syllabus, remember she was teaching in Racine at that time. Did she, did she find it after she moved back to Madison in the 70s? I don't know, but there it is. There's her phone number, give her a call. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, that's my note, 1964, but I've got, I've got the whole book, so you, you can see the copyright page and uh, the date of publication. <clears throat> so that's the page from the notebook, from this notebook. And then, you know, just again, my, fr my, my obsession further comes out. Paula's handwriting at the bottom. I just can't help but notice that if you look at the handwriting for the rest of the, the minutes, you know, it's similar. Mm -hmm. Paula was in the club in 1939, probably at this meeting. She's a woman. We need somebody to take notes. <laughs> Who are you gonna turn to? So Paula, she wasn't the secretary of the club. The club had a secretary at this time. Dr. Huffer was the secretary. I don't have any examples of Dr. Huffer's handwriting, so I can't compare, but I believe that Paula probably wrote the top two. I don't know. This is complete speculation. But it's possible that Paula was the sometime note taker at the club. It's possible that Paula was the owner of the notebook. And then when Paula left and went to Racine and McFarland and Randolph, the notebook may have gone with her and was lost to the club. But when Paula came back to the club in the 1970s, I like to imagine Paula got this notebook and gave it back to the club. Somebody in the club took possession of it because we now have it. I know, for instance, that Bob Mansky had this in the 1990s because Bob Mansky put excerpts of these minutes in the newsletter. And I was always fascinated by that. I wondered where he got it. And now I know because Bob had this. And Bob at that time uh, wrote in a newsletter, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this very soon. Um, at that time in the 90s, there was a member of the club. She is still a member, Paula Puffer. Uh, Bob had this, so Bob knew about Paula Burner. Paula Burner's name was frequently misspelled. Sometimes it was Paula Burney. Sometimes it was Paula Byrne. And then, of course, she got married and it was Paula Carey. So the uninformed reader may come to the conclusion that you know, there were three or four Paulas in the club. Bob Mansky made the comment once, having quoted part of this Paula Burner, the number of famous Paulas in MAS is astounding. He was flattering <laughs> Paula Puffer. Bob had no idea that there were only two. Our Paula Puffer and Paula Berner, Bernie, Paula Carey, she was the one. So this will be on that table after the meeting. I do ask, please take a look at it because it's great. Don't pick it up, leave it lying flat. It's falling apart. Open it up, turn the pages, take a look at it, but treat it very, very gently. This is like the Rosetta Stone for the club. <clears throat> in conclusion, there were a number of other notable women in the club. I have great backstories on all five of these women. The bottom two, Peg Frisch and Doris Koster, are still living. I've spoken to both of them. I've visited with both of them. I've gotten great things from both of them. Part of the history of the club, Charlotte Stewart, Joanna Over. These are great, great stories. There aren't a lot of stories of prominent women in the club, but I'm very happy that there are a few, and there's some, some really good ones there. <clears throat> so. This is it. It's printed. Copies will be on the table as well. <clears throat> the table of contents. Nine chapters, some appendices. These are nine stories. Nine great stories. I don't go into the biographical detail that I did tonight in this meeting, but I do include a section at the end, Appendix C, People. 
the longest section uh, where I tell some of the stories of the people. Um, I want you guys to read it. Um, I have extra copies. To recoup my copying expenses, I'm going to ask $10 for a copy. That'll help to pay for getting the copies made. Uh, and the board, at some point, will decide where to go with it, maybe to print additional copies, maybe it's something we can keep and make available at Christmas, like we do calendars and things like that. But I want future historians, because I know somebody's going to come back in 2135 for the 200th anniversary of the club or whatever. And they're, they're going to want to, you know, and, and they will have a good, solid head start. So that's it. I'm going to put my show and tell items over on the table. Um, I would be happy to take a few questions while I'm doing that. I'll keep the microphone with me. Lawrence has the microphone for the audience. If anybody has any questions, be happy to take those. And I'm going to go over and start laying some things out. <laughs> Carolyn. Yeah, Carolyn, if anybody, because you and I have talked about Paula Brown before, did anybody contact the cemetery that she's buried in Appleton? I'm sorry, contact? The cemetery that she's buried at in Appleton? I never even thought of contacting the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow morning, I have Anshal be on the phone um, to find out because I, I have the name of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. But no, I've never, I've never followed up on that lead. I could, I could fill a page with the attempts that I have made to contact people who knew Paula, mm -hmm. including school districts, Madison, Racine, um, and I've, I've just absolutely. When people don't have children and therefore grandchildren, when they're when they're old enough that their siblings. Mm -hmm and their siblings' descendants, the family tree gets so complicated, yeah. it's very, very difficult to do. So I, I've, I've got nothing, but that's a and good idea. And I want to agree with you, too, that I think that the note on the, the oh, yeah, those notes were written by her. I think it's clear, because when you look at the Ys and the Ms, and there were some of the letters in there that, to me, were very clear. Yeah. And, and sometimes we all, if you're writing a little more hurriedly or, you know, you change the, but, but I think that they were written by her as well. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Notice how I wrote about this person also in, etc. Yeah, yeah. Paul Berner, amazing, absolutely amazing. Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay some, feel free to come up here and take a look at uh, the stuff that I brought. Really cool stuff, and the biography or the I'm sorry, the history is is over there at the right. Well, thank you very much, John. That's a really great presentation and. Thank you so much for going through the effort to uh, do all this research, compile it very carefully, and uh, print it out tonight. Great job, great job. Oh, yes, yes. you're raising your hand? or Oh, you're just... <laughs> well, all right. I guess that will conclude uh, this month's meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society, and we look forward to meeting with you again. The next meeting is coming up on... Oh, I'm looking for my notes. Is it, it's November 11th? Yes, November 11th. And I'm paraphrasing the title of the talk, but it's going to be about cosmic chemistry. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night.